Hello, everyone. This is David Meltzer, the Chief Technology Officer at Tripwire. And today, I'm joined by Travis Smith, Principal Security Researcher at Tripwire, who's going to talk about the security for work from home tools. Travis and I are delivering these from our home office, and I'm sure most of you are sitting in your home office or maybe on your couch listening to this webinar. Let's jump into the agenda. Travis is going to start off the presentation talking about the challenges, common mistakes, and what to do about the remote workforce and how to maintain a secure and compliant posture when you're dealing with an increased use of collaboration tools. After that, I'm going to share some recent survey data we have from over 300 IT security professionals about the impact to cybersecurity that the COVID-19 pandemic has had. A lot of interesting data in that report, and I think it's going to be really interesting to hear uh, what your peers are thinking and doing about the changing workforce as well as some of the other challenges we're facing. With that, let me hand it off to Travis. Thanks, David. So as we're all very aware, a few months ago, a large portion of the workforce was suddenly shifting to working from home. Uh, for those of us that were fortunate enough to transition to become remote employees, mileage varied widely on how seamless that transition has been. Right, we can all remember the newsreel from a few years back when a man's toddler bopped on the screen in the middle of an interview. Uh, it's likely that most of us today have been on a call uh, or even a video chat in the last few weeks and someone's kid or dog poked the head onto the screen. Uh, it's also a toss-up on which of the two phrases are heard most often on conference calls. Right? It's either, uh, you know, sorry, I was on mute, or can you all see my screen now? <clears throat> While many of these are personal anecdotes uh, on some of the struggles that we faced individually, the businesses that were tasked with keeping safe and online have seen challenges as well. Right? The child or pet on a video call is you know, the lack of multi-factor authentication. Or you know, can you see my screen is uh, getting an overutilized VPN back online. Now, this is a new normal uh, for everyone and every business. Right? Many of these challenges can cause security and privacy nightmares if they're not managed correctly. So today I'd like to go over some of the challenges that I've seen pop up and some actionable steps that you can take to try to remedy these. The novel coronavirus is shifting how business is conducted across the world. What was once critical FaceTime meetings are no longer possible in person. This could be human connection in one-on-one -on -one meetings with managers or collaboration with like-minded individuals on projects in a conference room. Personally speaking, some of my best ideas have come from bouncing ideas off colleagues in a room with a whiteboard to flesh out ideas what we were working on. For many across the country, having a fully staffed office again may be weeks, if not months, away. While some may applaud the lack of in-person meetings, the advantages of impromptu water cooler conversations have been a staple of American business for decades. Now these actions are becoming virtual. For a lot of organizations, the shift has been occurring for several years. Some organizations are even born into the remote workforce model, and this is just second nature to them. For many others, though, this is a new frontier that they're trying to navigate these days. Meetings, not only the individual one-on-ones, but the mass gatherings of employees have also moved to the Internet. Tools like Zoom and WebEx and GoToMeeting and even Teams are popular choices for many businesses. The ability to video conference and feel some sort of human connection has become important for many employees. Collaboration is happening online with various tools which have been available for years, such as SharePoint and Confluence. Previously, unknown offerings from businesses are now being adopted at a quicker pace as well, such as whiteboard.microsoft.com to replace whiteboards that we had in conference rooms. The ability to connect to company resources from anywhere in the world is nothing new. But now they may be wide, more widely used across the board. Similar to chat, pro, uh, chat programs such as Teams and Slack, which may have been used less in favor of in-person discussions are now relied on more heavily. These are just a few examples, but every aspect of business is moving virtual to minimize the interruption to the business. Some of the tools help enable this are, are from well-known organizations, which have been around for decades. As such, they may have more mature security development processes than some of the newer technologies, which may have been repurposed for the world we live in today. The Amazon Web Services security model brings up something to think about when adopting these types of technologies for working from home. There's a common misconception that cloud providers handle all security, possibly left over from the era of hosting providers. While there are specific items that the provider is going to be responsible for, the truth here is that there is a lot of security which the customer is also responsible for. 
However, there's also shared controls and customer-specific controls, which the customer must maintain in order to have a secure deployment of the service that's in question. Now, while there are many challenges, this can cause some mistakes that can be made with the implementation of some of the work from home tools we've been talking about. Uh, here's a few examples of what we've seen in the past and how to avoid them. First, it's important to understand that oftentimes, products and services are shipped in an insecure state in order to make them more approachable by the general public. This is true from everything from Windows operating systems to tools I brought up today. The reason for this is that the maker of these services wants to reduce the friction for customers to use what they've built. When security implements controls to increase friction, it can be a risk for losing users. It's going to be up to you as the customer to shift some of the usability over to security. However, having a secure ecosystem of tools for working from home doesn't mean that these tools are completely unusable. The first, which I see a lot, is how client-side updates are handled. Oftentimes, with work from home services, there's a client-side application running which connects the user to the service in question. This could be a VPN client, a chat program, or even a browser extension to connect to a video conferencing service. Each of these are code running on endpoints, which can become an entry point for attackers. It's important to understand how these are kept up to date. Many of these work from home vendors have vulnerabilities discovered in the client side applications. Are these applications configured to automatically update? Are they going to alert the user that the update is available and that they, the user themselves need to install the update? Or are you left on your own to manage how these updates are applied? Next are privacy controls. The purpose of these work from home tools is to enable business operations worldwide which may have previously been conducted behind closed doors. Because of this, there are opportunities for private information to leak in previous ways that we did not know about. And finally, there's password policies. This can include password complexity requirements or multi-factor authentication, uh, as well as just simply setting a password for some of these services. All of these have caused problems for users in the past when looking at these work from home tools. Here's an example of the client side updates being an issue. Widely used programs such as Slack, Zoom, and Microsoft Teams have all had security issues in their client-side applications in the past year alone. Slack had a vulnerability last year, which allowed a malicious link to change where documents are saved, potentially causing a huge headache uh, with leaking information to attackers. Uh, Zoom has also had various vulnerabilities reported recently, mainly due to the fact that more researchers are looking into this suddenly popular tool. Likewise, Microsoft Teams has also had issues with vulnerabilities allowing attackers to control meetings and increase their permissions within the environment. All of these uh, pieces of software, all complex software, is going to have bugs. The great news is that these vendors are taking security seriously and are publishing updates to the applications. However, if these are left unpatched, what is the overall risk to your business? In other cases, we can see misconfiguration that can cause gaps in security, specifically operation security. Here we can see a screenshot that Boris Johnson shared back in March touting how his cabinet meetings were continuing with everyone being safe at home. However, here we can see a Zoom account was configured to display the meeting ID used to connect to the meeting uh, in the title bar on the top left. He's also sharing the names of everyone in the meeting as well. So if there's no password enabled to join this meeting, this could be a huge risk. If there is a password, the risk then becomes that any number of these attendees are prime phishing candidates to get that password. For users attending, it may be a good idea to use the feature to, in tools like Zoom and Teams and WebEx to either blur or change your background. In many of these cases, information which may be valuable to attackers could be hiding right behind you. And this brings me to my last point, which is for password security. War dialing is not a new concept. In fact, it's even been used to conduct uh, against WebEx for years. However, with the increased popularity of Zoom, this brings increased focus from the hacker community. Uh, this new tool, Z War Dial, is available on GitHub and can scan hundreds of meeting IDs within seconds and automatically detect which ones it can enter without a passcode. So even if you are not publicly screenshotting your meeting IDs to the world, hackers can still quickly identify if you're one of the meetings who are open up to anyone. While setting a password will help prevent that, only having a password on service is not, is not enough. Credential stuffing is another uh, uh, common ploy from attackers that they'll take password dumps from other uh, various breaches, could be you know, a, a blog or a forum, and then they're gonna reuse those credentials on other services such as banks, social media, uh, or even these work from home type tools. Microsoft released a study last year saying that nearly all of the automatic account takeover attempts, uh, such as credential stuffing, can be prevented by having some form of multi-factor authentication, 
uh, be it a one-time code, uh, an SMS message, or even an email. And this is not all just doom and gloom. There are some next steps for securing these types of work from home tools that are available to everybody. So here are a few options that you can start taking today to start securing these tools if you're using them within your own organization. One of the better hardening tools that we've had available to, as defenders these days are benchmarks from CIS or the Security Technical Implementation Guides or STIGs from DISA. These provide very prescriptive guidance on how to lock down operating systems or applications or various other uh, services or devices. Uh, unfortunately, these are hard to come by for tools which are enabling working from home. Uh, there is Citrix hardening guides from DISA, and those were just made, uh, recently made available. Uh, and there's benchmarks from CIS and DISA also for traditional VPNs and firewalls. So those could be an option. Uh, so it's worth looking up on the CIS website as well as the uh, DISA website that are listed here uh, to see if any of the tools that you're using uh, have some of these hardening benchmarks available. Uh, if a hardening benchmark is not available, the next best option is to look into the security guides and best practices which are published by the vendors. Oftentimes, this is a critical source for both CIS and DISA uh, when they are creating their own hardening benchmarks. The downside to these guides is that vendors uh, are oftentimes a little less prescriptive than CIS and DISA, whereas CIS and DISA will tell you a specific setting or a specific uh, key or you know, what to set that to. Uh, the hardening guides and best practices will require a little bit of interpretation on your part to properly implement. Uh, and many of these are just simply found by searching Google uh, for the service provider name, uh, followed by a hardening guide or best practices. Uh, for example, you know, Zoom hardening guide uh, or Cisco WebEx best practices. Uh, when in doubt, you can always reach out to the provider and see what they may have available for you, uh, or even a third-party service provider can have this information as well. And when all else fails, you can fall back on the CIS critical security controls. Uh, while they may not match directly to what work from home tools we're discussing today, they should be broad enough to adapt to get some sort of simulation of a security guidance for any service in question. And some of the key considerations uh, to ask are, you know, what services are we using? Uh, similar to the critical security controls one and two, you need to know what you have in your environment to secure as a starting point, right? You can't secure something that you don't know about. Uh, how are users connecting? Are they only able to access when they are connected to the VPN? Uh, does it require a client-side application to be installed? Uh, are there mobile apps to consider? All of these will have an effect on the overall security of your organization. Right, are, are they going to be using client-side software? And if they are, how is that updated? Uh, so that's something that we've already discussed today. Are the services hardened properly? Right? Are the, the proper security controls in place to prevent attackers from getting in? or preventing users from releasing private information? Uh, what are your uh, password policies? Right? For conference calls and screen sharing services, passwords are critical. Uh, for general authentication into services, some sort of multi-factor authentication is important to prevent the automatic ta account takeover that we've discussed. And what are the privacy considerations? The lack of control with users being able to remote in can produce scenarios where the company information can be leaked unintentionally. Each service can have an impact on the privacy of your employees, uh, your customers, and your company's confidential information. Thanks, Travis. A lot of great information in there. Now I'm going to shift gears and talk about the key findings from Tripwire's COVID-19 Cybersecurity Impact Report, which we published just last week. This report surveyed IT security professionals uh, from various size and types of organizations to find out what are they feeling, thinking, and doing about COVID-19 within their own organizations. I think it's really important in security to be talking to and understanding what are the best practices and what are the peers in your industry doing. Uh, and this is some really statistically significant recent data that will help you do just that. Let's jump into the results. So first, just to lay the landscape for what you're going to be seeing, uh, we had a response of 345 individuals, all doing IT security at companies with at least 100 employees. And here's a little bit of the demographic data so you can hone in on how this might fit with your organization. Uh, first, it was a global survey, uh, but three quarters of the results came from the Americas region, uh, with 18% from uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and 8% from Asia Pacific. Uh, and so that's certainly going to skew the results somewhat towards the United States and Canadian responses versus, uh, for instance, APAC and especially China 
in some ways are ahead of uh, where the U.S. is from a COVID response, as we all know. Uh, company size pretty evenly split between um, mid-size to large organizations. You can see a kind of a third, third, third there. And then from who responded, uh, individual contributors a third, managers were the largest proportion, so kind of a mid-level range uh, IT security manager, 47%, and then executives, 21%. So uh, a pretty good cross-section of, uh, of the world and of different companies. First key finding about the current threat landscape out there, 63% said they experienced COVID-19 related attacks. At Tripwire, we've been doing on our state of security blog, uh, which is a great resource for timely information, uh, a scam roundup of COVID-19 related scams happening on the internet every week. And so certainly we've seen a major uptick of attackers taking advantage of COVID-19 to tailor their phishing attacks and other sorts of online scams. And uh, we're seeing a lot of organizations that are seeing that same impact as well. Second interesting finding, 65% of our respondents reported their security had worsened because of COVID-19. Obviously, this raises more questions than it answers by itself. Uh, why uh, has their security worsened? Uh, how are they judging their security relative to COVID-19? Uh, and what's happening? But certainly the proliferation of the remote workforce, as Travis was talking about, has been a key contributor to why people may believe that their security is not quite as in control uh, today with a very distributed amount of sensitive security data passing around all of their employees' homes as maybe they thought it was uh, when people are working locally in a single office. To dig into that a little bit deeper, uh, we do have some more detailed information here. Uh, so first, particularly on the work from home area, as uh, that's the topic of our, our webinar, we asked the question, uh, what was your company's approach to employees working from home? And uh, I wasn't particularly surprised by the results, but uh, interesting to see the exact numbers. Uh, so 56% made a rapid shift. 27% uh, already had people working from home, but increased significantly. Um, 10% had a lot of people already working from home and only a small increase, and 7% did not make the shift. And you can imagine 7% being largely uh, essential businesses, uh, people where uh, had to go to work for you no know, other reason that they couldn't do their job remotely. And certainly in many organizations, we have uh, a small percentage of people that that all applies to, but things like retail, healthcare, uh, and manufacturing, you, you need the people there. So um, not really surprising results, but certainly that 83% uh, is really the highlight. Next key finding, and I won't go through every line in here, but you can read through it. 94% of our respondents are more concerned about security now than before COVID-19, uh, which is interesting. As IT security professionals, we're probably all very concerned about security to begin with, but you can see the highlight here, employee home network security. Um, as the number one new concern, and not just a concern, but also something that many organizations struggle to even think about, well, do I want to take any responsibility for that employee's home security? Uh, and increasingly thinking about things like a zero trust security models where uh, I do need to maintain the security of my sensitive data, but certainly I really don't want to be responsible for the security of the home network anyway. So how do I do that? And certainly we talk about different technologies like uh, virtual desktops and these collaboration tools. Uh, but it is difficult when you're now in a much less controlled network environment than you were living in in the work office environment. Some of the other things that were highlighted here, uh, increase of ransomware phishing attacks, certainly saw in the earlier question, we've seen those. And the need to be able to deal with remote systems that are not connected to the network is certainly a challenge that is now true more than ever. So those being the challenges professionals are taking, let's shift now to what are people doing about it. So first, the immediate steps. 84% of security pros are already doing something about COVID-19. And uh, this tracks to my own experience talking to different security organizations as well. The first thing that organizations are doing, more than half of them, is expand the current tools they're using. And at the same time, we see about half of organizations said 
they put some pause onto new projects. So increasingly people are looking to say, well, what are the new use cases? What's the value I can get from what I already have? Uh, but also we had projects that were queued up for this year that were all identified as important to close gaps in our security posture. So this is definitely causing a shift to how many organizations are operating this year and replanning the year around our project priorities. You can see that there are increases in new tools and budgets, but that's now taken a minority. Uh, I bet going into the year, that number was probably um, probably ahead of three quarters of organizations uh, were seeing some sort of increase. Uh, and so, you know, shift to budget, shift to priority, do more with what you have seems to be the immediate mantra of many security pros out there. Well, when, when people think about immediacy, we think about probably the March, April timeframe when everyone was scrambling in the world to deal with the new remote workforce and increase in network bandwidth and many of the collaboration tools were having outages because of the increased capacity. And so we saw the pause that many people talked about you know, back a month, two months ago. So now I think many organizations are starting to even now look to the future and say, what are we going to do to prepare better? And so this is the next survey result that I thought was valuable to look at, which is we see, although we saw a short-term pause, now more than half of organizations are starting to look for new tools to say in this new environment where I have increases of remote work, where it's more difficult to maintain some of the security and compliant posture, what are the new tools that I can take advantage of, uh, as well as a continuation of what we saw in the immediate impact side, which is how can I better use the existing tools that I have, particularly if I'm having a little bit of more budget constraint. And we are seeing a lot of organizations where uh, the overall data says the security budgets are still growing this year, uh, but they're growing about 5% less than people thought they would going into the year. So if we have less money to spend, we have to uh, get more efficient with that money usage. And so more use cases for the tools we have uh, and making sure that we're honing in the new tools to the particular priorities we have seems like it's going to make sense. Interestingly, about 14% of our respondents said they did expect their security budget to actually decline this year. Uh, and I'm sure everyone's watching closely to see how the macroeconomic conditions are going to evolve. Well, there's a lot more of the survey questions and results that are available in the Remote Work and COVID-19 Cybersecurity Impact Report sponsored by Tripwire. And if you want to get a full copy of that report, it's, uh, the link is below. And uh, you also could just Google Tripwire COVID-19 report, and uh, it'll show up for you as well. So hopefully uh, you can dig into this. And if you need some more data for your own organization or to explain to your bosses what some of your peers are doing, uh, this is a great source of resources. In addition, the Tripwire State of Security blog has a number of different posts that we've made around more detailed work from home enablement settings and security configurations you can take advantage of, uh, as well as things like our weekly COVID-19 scam roundup that is tracking the latest of what's going out there on the wild. So take advantage of the resources that uh, Tripwire is making available here, and hopefully you can make use of it in your company. Before we open the floor to questions, let me spend a minute telling you about Tripwire as the sponsor of the webcast. Tripwire, you can think of as the invisible line of defense in the sand, protecting your critical systems. To protect yourself, you need to know a couple of key things about your systems and network. What devices do you have? Where are the security risks on those devices? What's changing on those devices, particularly changes that might be suspicious malicious or unintended? And are your systems properly configured in accordance with your own security policies, security best practices, and external security standards and regulations that you may need to adhere to? With Tripwire, you know all of this information. Tripwire started providing integrity monitoring, particularly file integrity monitoring over 20 years ago. But over time, We've expanded the use cases for Tripwire, and now many of the leading organizations in the world use Tripwire to protect their modern hybrid environments. A couple of the key use cases for Tripwire, and if any of these 
uh, pique your interest or are particular projects that you're interested in pursuing, please reach out to us where we can provide you a lot more information about how your peers are using Tripwire for tools like this. First, integrity monitoring, knowing when important changes are happening to your most critical systems. As an audit control, Tripwire can tell you what changed, who made the change, and what is the security and compliance implications of those changes, helping you sort through a sea of thousands of changes happening across all of your systems all the time to identify, here's the one that happened today I really need to pay attention to. Locking down your systems with proper security configuration is one of the best ways to actually reduce the attack surface and make sure your environment stays in a secure state. So helping to harden those systems with a library of over 700 best practices policies is another common way our customers are using, using Tripwire today. Tripwire has a leading vulnerability management solution that's available both in physical and virtual appliances, as well as a managed service backed by some of the security researchers that are the world's experts in how to run large-scale vulnerability management programs. So if you're looking to upgrade your vulnerability management program, not just with technology, but with the world's experts in people in running these things, uh, Tripwire has a great solution for that as well. Tripwire is the leader in the industrial cybersecurity market. So if you're an organization that's dealing not just with IT tools, but with the convergence of IT and OT, industrial control machines, manufacturing, oil and gas pipelines, transportation systems, uh, or systems like that, Tripwire has additional technology and solutions that bring that technology together to offer you everything from an introductory service to give you a quick health check of the security of your OT part of your network, all the way to comprehensive passive network monitoring, log management, and system monitoring to solve your industrial cybersecurity challenges and do it in a safe and secure way. Increasingly, our modern IT organizations are adopting new cloud and DevOps methodologies to how they're developing applications and rolling them out into production. And increasingly, Tripwire's customers are using some of the new technology we've developed to integrate Tripwire into their DevOps CI-CD pipelines and extending controls from their on-premise systems to applications that are built in both public and private clouds. And Tripwire has been building and investing technology over the years to extend our controls so you can cover your entire hybrid enterprise. Obviously, that's a very quick introduction to a broad security portfolio Tripwire has, but maybe it's piqued your interest a little bit. And if you want more information, certainly reach out to us. Thank you for listening to the webinar today. I hope it's been educational, and I hope you found a little bit of information you can bring back to your organization to help as you plan and execute on your security plans for 2020. With that, we're gonna open the floor to questions. Thanks everyone for listening today. Uh, we do have some time for some Q&A. Uh, if you have questions to ask, uh, go ahead and open your question uh, box in the uh, webinar and uh, type it in there and uh, we have time to answer some. So let's jump right into it. Uh, first, uh, for Travis, I've read a lot about Zoom in the news. Uh, should I avoid using Zoom altogether? Uh, how, sh how should I think about Zoom security? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't be too concerned about Zoom uh, itself. Uh, we, we have seen a lot of uh, news come up about Zoom, uh, specifically around some of their security uh, issues that have come up in the past. Uh, and most of that has just come because uh, with the increased usage of Zoom, it's become you know, this popular software that not only businesses are using, uh, but you know, people uh, around the world are using to stay connected. Uh, and with increased focus and increased usage like that, it gets the eyes of you know, security researchers and people like that that are uh, eager to look for new bugs and, and, and write about it. Uh, so, you know, there have been some that have been re uh, released out there, uh, but Zoom has been very quick and very uh, forthcoming and uh, transparent about those uh, and get them uh, released and, and fixed very, very quickly. Uh, so I don't, I don't see any issue with, with using Zoom. Uh, there is a really good blog that we have on the Tripwire website uh, that was written last week, uh, which are eight tips on uh, using and securing Zoom. Uh, so things like we talked about today of, you know, setting passwords, having a waiting room, being able to remove participants and make sure that they don't join back in, 
uh, disabling file transfer, that kind of thing. So a lot of good tips that are in that blog uh, that I recommend people take a look at. Excellent. Uh, next question. Uh, this organization is using uh, Microsoft Teams uh, for sensitive meetings. Uh, how serious are any team security issues? Uh, similar question to Zoom there. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's kind of in the same bucket. Uh, for me, you know, personally, uh, I'd be you know, concerned about it, uh, but not, you know, concerned enough that I'm not going to use something like Teams, right? Teams itself is backed by Microsoft, which has a, a very large and, uh, you know, incredibly smart team that does, you know, security that they take security seriously, obviously. Um, so, you know, I would just, you know, follow industry best practices uh, for securing things, uh, for, you know, following, um, you know, being a secure uh, person on the internet, uh, don't click on links and don't um, open attachments, those type of things. Those apply not only to email, they should apply to things like Teams as well. Excellent. Uh, next question, any tips for dealing with my employees' home network security? I, I saw that was mentioned in the survey uh, as a, a new area of concern for people. Yeah, um, so the, the US CERT has a, a, a neat little uh, website that they have uh, where they have a bunch of tips for securing your own home network. Um, so, I mean, but from the, this, these things go from anywhere from setting passwords to installing antivirus, um, which look a lot like the Center for Internet Security's critical security controls. Um, so if you're using those, they look exactly the same. Uh, so those could be some good refreshers to, to send to employees. Uh, but it does things that, you know, all the way detailed as reduce your wireless emissions to make sure that your wireless signal isn't going outside your house, which is, uh, you know, incredibly crazy. Uh, but, you know, treat, just have employees treat their, their home network like the work network. Um, you know, don't give passwords to your laptops and computers to, to your kids so they could use it, you know, their own Zoom meetings. Good, good advice there for sure. Um, this is a more generalized question. Uh, what do you recommend for a company that falls a victim to a hacker? Um, what are the next steps they should take? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I so <laughs> that's an incredibly uh, broad answer. Um, it depends on the scope of the attack uh, and what that is. Uh, the, the first step is to, to understand the scope of the breach. Uh, um, that could be uh, as simple as we have ransomware on one computer, uh, and you know, ransomware is designed to be, you know, show you exactly which computers are infected so the hacker can get their, their ransom. Uh, and it could be something incredibly advanced where it is, you know, hiding in, in your environment. Um, and it could be across, you know, multiple systems, multiple networks, uh, all those types of things. So definitely uh, understanding the, the full scope of the breach uh, to make sure that when you do eradicate them and you go through your incident response process, they're not coming back and you're not just playing this game of whack-a-mole where uh, you spot a piece of malware, you delete it, and then all of a sudden it pops right back up because they have persistence somewhere else, or uh, they have, you know, uh, infected a different part of the network, or they're exploiting a vulnerability on your, uh, you know, public-facing application. Yep, and uh, yeah, just to add to that, and that that general area of security of what do you do when you're breached is incident response. So you know, read up on on incident response, and also certainly our partners at Optiv. Uh, have some uh, a lot of experts on how to deal with incidents and like, successfully. So you may want to uh, talk to your partner there. Uh, another question here on uh, another collaboration tool, uh, WebEx. Um, how do you think about security of, of WebEx and any concerns there, Travis? Yeah, I mean, WebEx is really the original Zoom, right? If you think of it in broad uh, perspectives, uh, WebEx has been used for screen sharing and video conferencing for uh, decades. I mean, I remember using it back in the early 2000s. Uh, and, you know, uh, WebEx is owned by Cisco, again, another security company that takes it very serious. Uh, they do have their best practices out there. Uh, I would say it's secure. Uh, it has the same uh, sort of uh, best practice issues of making sure you have, you know, passwords set for meetings and things like that that you'd want to follow. Uh, but I, I see no issue with WebEx. Excellent. Uh Quick question about Tripwire. Does Tripwire do customized programs for companies or is it a set package? Uh, I'll address that real quick. Um, yeah, Tripwire, uh, we do have out of the box software, uh, both software packages, hardware appliances, uh, cloud-based services we offer. Uh, and uh, you know, there are out of the box configurations for many, uh, many of our customers, uh, but we also offer professional services and customization. Uh, so certainly reach out to us if you wanna get uh, more information about how we can make Tripwire work for your organization. Uh, let's see, it looks like we have time for uh, one more question here. Um, 
uh, this is a good one. How do we know if a collaboration tool is just inherently insecure and I should avoid it altogether? Uh, or if it's something that uh, would be uh, reasonable for me to use within my organization? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can take that one. So, I mean, I, I would look at any collaboration tool like I would any other piece of software uh, that I'd be bringing into my organization uh, and look at it with a skeptical eye. Um, you know, assume that it's insecure before I deploy it to everybody uh, and then and then go from there. Uh, you know, so what I would do uh, for myself is, you know, look for, you know, the, the best practices. Uh, I think I talked about, touched on this earlier. Uh, see if there are hardening to benchmarks available for, for it to make sure I can, you know, lock it down towards industry best practices. Uh, and if there aren't, look for, you know, the best practices or hardening guides from the vendor. Uh, if I see a vendor has, you know, security best practices for their product, uh, I, I can assume that they're taking security seriously. Um, and then my last step is, you know, from a broad perspective, is looking for vulnerabilities that are reported against it. Um, and that could be a little bit misleading because, you know, just because a product has vulnerabilities listed uh, doesn't mean that it's insecure, right? It could actually mean the exact opposite. Um, it means that they're taking security seriously. Uh, and on the inverse, it could mean that if, if I don't find any vulnerabilities reported for it, um, that doesn't mean that it's secure. It just means that nobody's looked at it yet. Yep. Well, thanks so much, Travis. Uh, great information there. And uh, thank, uh, thank you also to Optiv for partnering with us on this webinar. Uh, have a great day, everyone, and stay safe.